Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Leffler and I work in the policy office at the National Science Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the NSF Virtual Grants Conference. Before we begin, we'd like to take a poll to find out a little bit more about you. If you're using Zoom from a desktop browser, you may not be able to access the poll. Please be sure that you're viewing this presentation from the Zoom application. We've arranged for the entire grants conference to take place this year online with over two weeks worth of webinars for the research community with no more than two sessions per day. All of the sessions have been pre-recorded. However, we will be taking live Q&A. The sessions will run this week and the week of November 30th. For information about the sessions and our speakers, please visit the conference website. The content for this webinar series is similar as what it would be for an in-person conference. By the end of this conference, we want you to understand NSF, to know what we fund, and know how to prepare a good proposal. We want you to understand the merit review process at NSF, as well as your responsibilities for managing NSF awards. Sessions will range in scope from the broad overview of policies and processes to specific information about NSF programs and plans. If you do have questions, please submit them using the Q&A function. We are encouraging attendees to upvote questions. And to do that, you navigate to the Q&A function to view questions and click on the thumbs up button. This will bring the most popular questions to the top of the Q&A window. At the end of the presentation, we will spend about 15 minutes answering your questions. Please keep in mind that we have a lot of individuals uh, signed in for this session, so we may not be able to answer all of your questions. This session is being recorded and it will be made available on our website, nsfpolicyoutreach.com in the coming weeks. And we'll send an email uh, announcement as soon as sessions uh, start getting posted. If you do have any te technical difficulties during this presentation, please submit them in the Q&A and someone will assist you. I wanna thank you for participating in our poll. Um, we're happy and excited that you can join us as this marks NSF's first ever virtual grants conference. We've been conducting these conferences since 1993 and they started as small one day events with a handful of program staff and they've grown over the years to two full days and 26 NSF staff, and now a virtual event. We hope that you will enjoy the conference. I'm now pleased to present this session, which will cover an introduction to NSF and the types of funding opportunities that are available at NSF. This session will be covered by Caitlin Fife from the Budget Division and Samantha Hunter from the Policy Office. But first, we have a short video to share. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I'm deeply honored to be the 15th director of the National Science Foundation and to work with the amazing people of this agency and the community we support. Over the past seven decades, the groundbreaking research NSF has funded spans all fields of science, engineering, and STEM education. Whether exploring the depths of the universe or understanding the building blocks of life here on Earth, NSF proudly supports the discoverers who seek to expand knowledge and drive innovation to boost competitiveness and prosperity for our nation. Thank you for all that you do to support the mission of NSF and the science enterprise in the United States. I know together we will continue to do great things. Government has a responsibility to see that our country maintains its position in the advance of science. As a step toward this end, the Congress should complete action on the measure to create a National Science Foundation. For 70 years, NSF investments in people and places have helped build the backbone of America's scientific enterprise. We focus on the large, big questions, big projects. It means taking risks, staying the course, because game-changing breakthroughs 
don't come quickly. We have seen what we thought was unseeable. We focus on the small, where a single piece of new knowledge can advance an entire field or save a life. We are about exploring the world from the top, the bottom, and everywhere in between. We are about big ideas and bold vision. You see the results everywhere. Innovations, marvels, built on a foundation of research we empower. We make the impossible possible. Who are we? We are pioneers, risk takers, visionaries, who stand with the bold at the frontier's edge. And together, we transform the future. We are the National Science Foundation, and this is where discoveries and discoverers begin. Hello, my name is Caitlin Fife, and I'm here to provide an overview and introduction to NSF as an agency, including our financial information. Today we're going to cover a variety of topics, which includes an introduction to NSF as an organization and also provides you some additional context on our federal budget, an overview of our 2021 budget, some funding trends, and also some key documents. This presentation is pre-recorded, but please feel free to use the question and answer function and I will try to either answer them in real time in the chat function or save them for the live discussion period after the presentation. The, present, the picture you see here is NSF headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. And below, we've highlighted the mission and vision for NSF, which is to promote the progress of science, to advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare, and secure the national defense. We are a nation that is a global leader in research and innovation, and that is what we are working towards in all that we do each and every day. On this slide, you see a couple things that highlight um, who NSF is and how we are different than some of the other federal agencies um, that you may interact with. So first, it's important to note that we are an independent agency. Um, as you know, we support basic research and education. There are many other agencies that support research um, and education, but our emphasis here is on basic research. The primary way in which NSF um, engages with our community is through issuing grants. Um, we are an agency that is very lean, which means we have a very low overhead, and we utilize technology um, in order to be able to be as efficient and effective as possible. We have a discipline-based discipline organizational structure, um, and this is specifically related to, um, which I'll show you in upcoming slides in our organizational chart, um, that we have, for instance, in a directorate of engineering, we have um, a biology directorate. Um, however, just because we have discipline-based structure doesn't mean that we don't also have a lot of cross-disciplinary work um, and mechanisms that you probably see through our solicitations. Another unique factor about NSF is that we use rotators, or folks who are able to easily move between the communities and the research um, research entities and universities to come to NSF, leverage their expertise, and then return back to the communities. We feel that both NSF and the community in which we serve are stronger because of that mechanism. And then finally, another unique portion of, about NSF is that we have the National Science Board, which is a body that provides advise, advisory um, and oversight to NSF uh, in the work that we do. Uh, that is also included as part of our, each year we have many uh, meetings with the National Science Board that are open to the public um, that many of you may have attended in the past. Again, I just wanted to highlight um, the start of NSF um, and our focus on supporting basic research. Um, you can see um, Veneer Bush here and his um, quote, that has really, um, is really still alive in NSF 70 years later. As I referenced earlier, here's our organizational structure. You can see that we have um, our director and within the 
office of the director off to the right, there are several offices that focus on some of those cross-disciplinary um, or NSF-wide activities um, that I referenced earlier. You'll also see our director is a member of the National Science Board, um, and our Office of the Inspector General reports to the National Science Board. Below that, you see those discipline-specific um, organizations that I referenced, as well as down in the bottom right-hand corner, um, the organization that I'm a part of, Budget, Finance, and Award Management, and also another business functional area, the Information Resource Management um, Organization. I'm a numbers person, so it should come as no surprise that um, I find this slide a very um, helpful way to think about NSF, um, and we call this NSF by the numbers. As you can see, um, we try to quantify on this slide what our impact is to the community um, and to the nation at large. You'll see that we have um, our current budget is about $8.3 billion, and that 94% of that goes out to education and related um, research related activities. That was um, an earlier reference that I had set up the fact that NSF is, um, has very low overhead, and that's just a number to kind of back up that statement. We have a lot of proposals that come in. Um, not all of them are funded, but all of them are reviewed and evaluated. Um, I think in 2019, we had 41,000 of those. We funded 11,300 awards, and those supported 1,800 different institutions and over 300,000 people who were supported um, by NSF resources. Um, as you can also see, we leverage public-private partnerships, um, over $100 million in 2019. Um, we have invested over um, one point, or we have invested 1.4 billion in STEM education and workforce development. Um, and another source of pride for our agency is that we have funded over 240 um, Nobel Prize winners um, since 1951, um, including some of those who were just awarded this year. Another way to look at the impact that NSF has in the research community is to see what percentage of um, academic basic research we support by field. Um, and that's what's being reflected here. Um, you see for computer science, for instance, 87% of the academic basic research um, in that field is supported by NSF. And then on down the line, you can see the portion of federal research dollars um, that can be attributed um, to NSF and our support. And so again, this just goes to show um, that while $8.3 billion is not as large as some of the other R&D inve uh, investments that are happening across the federal government, there's still a significant portion of the academic basic research um, that is in NSF's wheelhouse. So on this slide, we have um, the 2021 NSF um, budget request to Congress. So each year, my team, in consultation with uh, many folks across the foundation, develop and work with the Office of Management and Budget and the administration to put forward our budget request to Congress. In FY 2021, that request was for $7.741 billion. Um, and you can find this budget request and all of the details on the NSF.gov website um, under the budget page. NSF has six budget accounts. Um, three of them, the top three that you see in this chart, are what we call our programmatic accounts. So research and related activities, education and human resources, and major research equipment and facilities construction. And then we have three accounts that we call our administrative accounts. So that includes agency operations and awards management, Office of the Inspector General, and the Office of the National Science Board. On this table, I'm showing the uh, most recent funding data that has been available. Um, we're at an interesting time of the year. We just closed out, as many of you know, on September 30th, um, fiscal year 2020. And we're still working to get those numbers finalized. Um, in the meantime, though, we have for FY 2019, we have the investments that were made for NSF in each of those accounts. The 2020 plan, which was our estimates at the beginning, 
um, of 2020. And then we also have that compared to the FY 2020 request that was sent up last winter. Now you might know that in the 2020 2021 request was a decrease. And it's important to note that um, we still have, we have a lot of congressional support um, and the administration also supports NSF, but that this number, the $7.7 billion is really to be taken into the larger context um, of the administration's budget request, which seeks to reduce um, the deficit and curtail some um, federal government spending. And so this is not a specific reduction that is um, directed only at NSF, but rather it's reflective of the larger budget scenario that was included as part of the administration's request in FY 2021. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, Caitlin, we, if we ended 2020 on September 30th, that means that we've already started 2021 October 1st, and you would be right. Um, however, we are in that period of the year where we are under a continuing resolution because the appropriations work for FY 2021 has not yet been completed. So we have um, met with staff and provided them all of the support and backup for our 2021 request. Um, appropriators are working on the funding bills and the House Appropriations um, Committee did provide their bill for NSF, which would be at 8.55 billion. What still remains is for the Senate to provide their um, appropriations bill and then for the two of those bills to um, be reconciled and come to an agreement so that there could be a, um, a joint appropriations bill that would then go to the president for signature. Um, right now, we're under a continuing resolution until December 11th, um, after which we will be either getting another continuing resolution um, or there's the potential that we would also um, have a full year bill um, but right now, as, as many of you are probably following the news, there are many other things that are taking up um, Congress's attention. And so we don't expect to have clarity on what will be happening after December 11th until we are into um, the month of December. This is not an unusual state for us to be in. Um, so what I've shown here is a about a 30 year history of NSF um, and the appropriations for each fiscal year when we have been under a CR. As you can see, um, we have not started the fiscal year with a full clarity on our appropriations since 1997. And if you were to look just since 2017, um, we have been almost halfway through the year. We have been at least halfway um, 120 days into the year before we saw our appropriations. Um, and right now for 2020, we know that we will be under uh, the continuing resolution until December 11th, and there's the potential that that would extend um, even beyond. So one thing that um, folks might be interested in seeing is how does this funding translate to the awards um, and the funding rates that we see year over year. And so what we've presented here are a, the total amount of awards and declines um, with the, in the bars. And then as you move across the chart with the line, we show the funding rate for NSF overall. Now, I, I will admit that, um, you know, there is, there is variation when it comes when you start looking at specific directorate or specific programs, um, but this is just to try to give you a sense of what the picture looks like for NSF as a whole. And so you can see for the last year where we had funding available or data available, um, the funding rate was 27%. However, it is also important to note that we saw significant, significantly fewer proposals. Um, overall. And while um, others, others might be better suited to speak to why that was the case, um, I do think that over recent years we have seen more of 
the directorates and programs at NSF go towards um, no deadlines, which has relieved a bit of proposal pressure. Um, but also important to note is that since 2016, um, when you're looking at total awards made, um, NSF has remained fairly steady um, between about uh, around 11, just under 12,000 and then um, to about 11,200. So um, as part of the organization of budget and uh, budget finance and awards, it's important for us to talk about responsible stewardship of those federal funds. Um, and when we're talking about those funds, I just up until now have been primarily speaking of um, awards that are made in any given year. However, as you all know, once a grant is made, it's active for several years. And so when you add all of that up, we are looking at $28 billion in total award funding um, that is active at any given time, given um, meaning that folks are, are actively working on those awards. And um, that's 54,000 in active awards. Um, and this includes a variety of mechanisms. So as I mentioned before, most of our awards go out through um, our standard and continuing grant uh, mechanisms. However, we also have cooperative agreements, graduate research fellowships, for instance, and other award types um, that, that factor into that 54,000 um, total. And then again, when you look at the number of awardees um, over all of those active awards, you see it um, increase to over 3,000 awardees. And this is, you know, most often we think about the universities and the four-year colleges, but um, we also uh, have important partnerships and relationships with nonprofits, community colleges, and also for-profit organizations um, that we engage with um, through those public-private partnerships. And um, also there's other awardees that are outside of those major categories. So for NSF, um, we have not just one, but multiple points at which we are providing oversight to those funds and um, to the awards. And that it, that's in the inset box here that I have, which is the pre-award reviews, of course, then the ongoing um, monitoring that happens, um, the business assistance that we're able to provide, the expenditure reviews, and also audit resolution um, are, are some of the areas where you may have touch points with us on this um, on the areas of fiscal responsibility specifically. So here are a couple of key documents if you want to um, know more. Obviously, obviously uh, for those of you who are familiar with these, these are much more detailed documents, um, but they are worth the read, I would say, um, as you continue to sort through some of the specific situations that you might be facing at your, your universities or your organizations. Um, I did put up here the, the link to the budget request, also the PAPG um, is up there first. We have a, our strategic plan, which guides kind of our investments and the chart that we're, or the charting the course that we are on. And then also we have our merit review report that goes to the National Science Board, um, which also gives you a sense of the state of um, NSF and some deeper resolution on some of the summary data that I provided um, on what NSF is funding and the mechanism types that I have referenced. So again, if you have any questions um, or would like to um, get some clarification on what I have touched on, in my presentation, please um, feel free to do so. And I believe that is the end of my formal remarks. Um, and I will uh, now turn it over to Samantha Hunter for the next portion of the presentation. Thank you for that, Caitlin. Uh, I'm Samantha Hunter, as mentioned, in the policy office. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm going to cover the uh, funding types uh, at the National Science Foundation. Next slide. We have uh, all the types listed here, as you can see. Uh, these are all of the uh, types of proposals 
uh, that we have the National Science Foundation, and all of these are described in the Bolton Award Policies and Procedures Guide, the PAP Guide. The PAP Guide will specify all the different components that you need to include for each type of proposal. NSF Electronic Systems uh, perform a compliance check of your proposal based on the required elements identified in the PAP Guide. For example, the system would know not to look for a biographical sketch as part of a conference proposal uh, because the PAP Guide says biographical sketch is not required for such proposal. Keep in mind, though, that you are only to include what we ask for in the PAP Guide and nothing else. So don't add extra uh, components to your proposal that are not required in the PAP Guide. Next slide, please. Let's start with RAPID, Grants for Rapid Response Research. This is a type of proposal that can be submitted anytime to the foundation. RAPID is a funding mechanism for projects that have a severe urgency around available availability uh, or access to data, facilities, or specialized equipment, including quick response on natural, anthropogenic, or similar unanticipated events and disasters. If you're thinking about submitting a RAPID proposal, here are some important takeaways. One, the first thing is you must contact the National Sci uh, an NSF program officer uh, that's cognizant to that program uh, prior to submitting a RAPID proposal. You'll need to tell them why this is urgent and why it's not appropriate to be submitted as a regular research proposal. This is why the success rate for RAPID and EAGER, which I'll talk about next, uh, those proposals tend to be higher because you first have that conversation with the program officer uh, prior to submitting your proposal. Next slide, please. EAGER, which I just mentioned, early concept grants for exploratory research. This type of proposal is used to support exploratory research in its early stages on untested but potentially transformative research ideas or approaches. We often call them high risk, high payoff. Eager proposals often would not review well under a regular review setting. As with rapid proposals, you must contact the program officer in the area most appropriate to your discipline and explain to them why this does not fit as a regular research proposal and why it will be a good fit as an eager. Next slide, please. RAISE, Research advanced, advanced by Interdisciplinary Science and Engineering. This supports bold interdisciplinary projects. These are large proposals. They're up to $1 million in five years. You must receive approval from two different NSF programs before you can submit a RAISE proposal. You will need to upload that concurrence document with your proposal. Before NSF funds a RAISE proposal, there are three criteria we look for. Uh, and the first, these are all outlined in the PAP guide, uh, there must be substantial funding necessary uh, from one, more than one program or discipline at NSF. Next, the lines of research promise transformational advances. And three, the discoveries reside at the interfaces of disciplinary boundaries, such that these proposals may not be recognized through traditional review or co-review. Race proposals are internally reviewed, if NSF determines that an external review is necessary, you'll be notified uh, of uh, that decision. And I should have said this earlier, the same is true for rapid and eager proposals. They're internally reviewed. If for some reason NSF uh, decides we need external review, you will be notified. Next slide, please. Goalie, grant opportunities for academic liaison with industry. This was historically a solicitation that was issued by the engineering directorate it was later determined that these types of proposals could be funded anywhere in the foundation. The concept is that uh, it's topics that address uh, the shared interests of academic researchers and industrial partners. For example, in some cases, students and faculty go to the industrial site and conduct the research in that industrial setting. These proposals are externally reviewed and focus on the degree to which industry will be involved. They can either be submitted as a full proposal or they can be submitted as a supplement to an existing NSF award. There must be at least one industrial partner as co-PI identified on the project. However, no funds may be requested for that part of the project. NSF funds the academic portion of the partnership, not the industrial part. As part of the proposal, we expect to see a goalie industrial confirmation letter that shows the industry is committing to participating in the project, and they're going to describe in that letter uh, the type of support that they will be providing. While engineering directorate uh, and NSF receives the most of these types of proposals, the reality is collaboration with industry can occur throughout the foundation. 
Next slide, please. Ideas Lab. No catchy title, just Ideas Lab. <laughs> Ideas Lab is a very different in terms of a process that we use for the majority of proposals. It's a concept borrowed from the uh, research councils of the United Kingdom. These projects' uh, ideas are typically uh, high risk, high impact, uh, as they represent a new and unproven idea, approach, or technology. The Ideas Lab proposal type is uh, implementing, implemented using uh, a four stage process, which is described in the Proposal and Award Policies and Procedures Guide. NSF selects panelists uh, who will serve as mentors in the process. Uh, we then ask people who would like to participate in the Ideas Lab to submit a preliminary proposal. But it's more about yourself, about your ability to work you know, within a team. Typically, 25 to 30 individuals are selected to participate in a five-day Ideas Lab. Throughout this, uh, people break into teams and ideas are developed. The panelists give you immediate feedback on those ideas. Based on that feedback, NSF will approve submission of full proposals. Next slide, please. FACET, or Facilitation Awards for Scientists and Engineers with Disabilities. These awards are intended to remove barriers to participation in research and training by persons with physical disabilities. These can either be a full proposal uh, or a supplemental funding uh, request to an existing NSF award. The intent is to purchase specialized equipment that would enable the individual to conduct the research. This is not uh, buying a, a basic computer or uh, things of that nature. Instead, it's about purchasing what is needed to allow you to participate in the research that you want to conduct. And so program officers make decisions about what constitutes approval, uh, I'm sorry, appropriate support. Uh, the proposals are typically reviewed along with regular competitive proposals or as supplemental funding requests, whichever the case may be. So however it comes in, that's how it's then reviewed. Next slide, please. Conference proposals. Now, conference proposals support uh, special areas of science that bring together experts. These are not your typical conferences that are already are funded by scientific uh, societies. They'll be supported only if equivalent results cannot be obtained uh, by atten attendance at regular meetings or uh, professional societies. The PAP guide provides very detailed and specialized instructions on preparing conference proposals. Again, if it's not required via the PAP guide, do not submit it uh, within that proposal. Conference proposals should be submitted at least one year in advance of the scheduled date. You'll find that required components of other types of proposals may not be required for conference proposals. So as I just said again, I, I'm stressing this because it's very important. If it is not require, a required section of the proposal, do not include it with that proposal. Next slide, please. Equipment. When you think equipment, you may think of our uh, major research instrumentation program or MRI. Equipment proposals are much smaller, much smaller magnitude than the MRI proposals. Track one for MRIs is $100,000 to less than $1 million, and track two, $1 million to $4 million. That's not this. <laughs> These proposals are much smaller than that. They provide something for a discipline or a department uh, that can help carry out research by having access to that specialized piece of equipment. As with conference proposals, there are detailed and special, specialized instructions in the PAP guide uh, for equipment proposals, and those uh, instructions should be followed. Next slide, please. Travel proposals. Until fairly recently, these types of proposals were called international travel grants, and they permitted a group of U.S. researchers, often including students, to attend a conference abroad. We realized that we were also funding travel grants for the same purpose uh, to attend domestic uh, conferences as well. Now travel awards can apply to international travel as well as domestic travel. As with the others, the PAP guide provides details on what elements must be included with the travel proposal. Next slide. Centers. Now centers are large complex awards that focus on uh, investigations and frontiers of knowledge that are not normally attainable through individual investigator awards. Centers are not considered research infrastructure, but will often use research infrastructure to meet their objectives. These proposals are submitted in response to a very detailed program solicitation. Most center awards are limited to a maximum of 10 years duration and are often subject to mid-course external review. Proposers interested in learning more about uh, current or future NSF centers are encouraged to contact an NSF program officer in the appropriate uh, discipline. Next slide, please. Research infrastructure. 
NSF defines research infrastructure as any combination of facilities, equipment, instrumentation, computational hardware or software, and the necessary supporting human capital. The NSF process and funding mechanisms for development and implementation of research infra infrastructure projects depends in part on the scale of the project. The largest projects, major facilities, are typically supported through the Major Research Equipment and Facilities Construction, or MREFC, account. You're strongly encouraged to contact the appropriate NSF program to discuss the availability of funding and the appropriate funding mechanisms in advance of proposal submission. Next slide, please. Fellowship. Fellowship proposals fall into two categories. One, uh, our flagship program here at NSF, uh, Graduate Research Fellowship Program, uh, and is run out of the uh, Directorate for Education and Human Resources. We also fund postdoctoral fellowships. There are about nine or 10 different disciplinary fellowships, uh, fellowship programs throughout the foundation. We have a link here on the slide uh, where you can find the fellowship programs. These awards are typically made directly to the individual to encourage can encourage the portability as often needed uh, by the individual. There are very specific instructions on what must be included in a fellowship program, a fellowship proposal, and it is dependent upon which postdoctoral fellowship you're applying to. You typically will, will receive a stipend and the duration identified in the solicitation, as well as some additional funding or administrative costs will be identified for you. Next slide, please. That brings me to the end. I thank you for your attention. As I mentioned throughout the presentation, the Proposal and Award Policies and Procedures Guide details the requirements for submitting a compliant proposal to NSF, no matter the proposal type. Uh, so again, I thank you. And as the slide says, ask early, ask often. We're gonna open it now for our Q&A session. Okay. Uh, thank you, Caitlin and Samantha very much. Um, so we have answered a number of questions in the chat, in the Q and A, as you've been typing them throughout the session. And we do have some coming in and we're gonna to get to some of those, but I wanna start with some of the ones where we, we, we answered a little bit of them um, in the Q and A, but we're gonna expand a little bit more on them. So uh, Caitlin, one of the questions was, and I don't, I, I'm, I, may, I may have missed that you answered this, but one of them was asking about a, a definition of basic research. Um, yeah, if, so, if we have yeah, a question about that. Not. Um, so I just, when we talk about basic research, we really mean research that is more theoretical and experimental work, um, primarily for the purposes of acquiring new knowledge and not with an implied or an, a particular application known at the point at which the proposal is put forward. Um, so to give a concrete example, this differentiates us from say NIH, which is interested in biomedical research or the Department of Defense that is um, specifically interested in science that can be leveraged for certain technologies that would assist in our national defense. Um, NSF does not assume a particular um, application. Um, we are just trying to further um, the knowledge base across all fields. Okay, and Caitlin, this is uh, another question for you, um, uh, and it deals with the delay in appropriations, and how does the delay in appropriations funding impact grants submitted from July through October 2020? Are those awards covered by 2019-2020 funding? How does that all work? Yeah, so, um, so we could get into the specifics of MEP. NSF has two-year appropriations. So when Congress provides us funding, um, for instance, funding that was provided last year was available for 2020 and 2021. Funding, um, it, when we get an appropriation, one will be available for 2021 and 2020 uh, for our program accounts. Um, so we could get into very complicated mapping of which dollar funds which thing. Um, but more importantly, what impacts the timing of awards is the timing of our solicitations, um, when the review panels and merit review takes place. Um, and then ultimately, um, you know, we have also for continuing awards, um, when people, when grantees actually submit their annual reports that are required to be submitted um, so that we can give them the next grant increment. Um, what I would say the, the way that the impact that it has isn't necessarily um, the uncertainty around appropriations, I wouldn't say ties specifically to an individual 
award, but more from the sense of us having uncertainty about how big the pot of funding available to NSF overall will be. Um, and each each program and each director kind of deals with that uncertainty um, a little bit differently. Um, so I wouldn't want to uh, say anything more specific than that because for um, each program, I could probably be wrong ten different ways. Right, and and a lot of program, a lot the directorates are are uh, they they all run programs, but they run them very differently. So mm -hmm. a lot of times the the answer that we're giving you when you have a specific question about a program is contact that program officer, con look, at, look at what that director at that division, that program has put on their website, because that information may all be out there, but it's not going to all be the same across, across NSF. Mm -hmm. um, Samantha, uh, we have a question about a, uh, is there a fund type that fits best to support equipment for lab for both research or teaching purposes? Um, well, we have the equipment proposal uh, and you would, you know, kind of define what it is you are requesting the funding for. Uh, so you would describe what, what you need for that particular, uh, you know, proposal. If it's under equipment, you're looking for equipment to support your lab or anything you need to support, then yes, we do have that type of proposal, that type of funding available. Okay, and another one for you, Samantha, um, asking about travel grants. Are travel grants still active during COVID? Travel grants are still active during COVID. It's a matter of if your institution is allowing travel, so uh, then yes, you still may apply for a travel grant, but that would then turn around. Uh, we would have to ask the question, or you would ask the question of your institution. Uh, is that something they are allowing? But absolutely, NSF is still open to supporting that. Okay, another question for you, Samantha, where can we find the deadlines for the types of proposals? In the deadlines will be associated with the solicitation. So in the program solicitation, uh, it will be right at the top of that solicitation. It will let you know when that proposal is due, the type of uh, due date that is required of that proposal. Right, and then there are also programs that may not have a solicitation, mm -hmm. but you're submitting an unsolicited proposal. So. In that case, what would somebody do? In that case, well, there is no deadline date for that. The deadline date would only accompany a solicitation. So if you are submitting an unsolicited proposal, you may want to reach out to that program officer, talk about it, find out if they're target dates, for instance, anything around windows of when, when a panel may come together at this point virtually may come together to discuss the proposals that have come in. So if there's a true deadline date that will be at the beginning of the program solicitation, uh, otherwise, you may want to reach out to the program officer to see when is it best to submit it to kind of meet a panel. Otherwise, it's up to you. You submit when you like. Okay. And another question, Samantha, do you or do you have funded projects with university and K through 12 collaborations? Yes. Yes, we do. Short and sweet. <laughs> that's a yes. That's a, that's a yes. <laughs> yeah. um, a question. This is. So this is um, about the graduate research fellowship, but is it asking is it for PhD students only or can master's students also be eligible? Yes, they, master's students are also eligible. So the answer is no, it is not for PhD students only. Right, and in that case, we would say, go to the solicitation because mm -hmm. every question you have about that program is gonna be in the graduate research fellowship program solicitation there's a section uh, eligibility requirements. So it talks about the eligibility of the uh, institution, you know, eligibility of that organization, if there are any limitations there. And it talks about the applicant's eligibility. So those details will be laid out in the solicitation. Okay, Samantha, another one. Um, if I have a research project in mind and after reviewing categories, uh, I'm still not sure where it is best suited, how can I identify which program officer would be best to speak with to decide which program would be best to go for in, a, in a, an application or a proposal? Okay, well, the first step would still be yours. Uh, you, you, so you think about what it is you're uh, thinking of applying to. You know, So you would come up with one area and NSF program officers talk to each other. So you may go to uh, one particular program officer and that program officer says, actually, you know, it would be best suited in this other uh, area at NSF. And so the program officers will then get you in touch with the other one as well. So 
they do speak with each other and you know collaborate and they, they just come together. So if you decide one area because you're not sure, but you pick one, just understand that you still may be sent to another area at NSF, but just start with one area that you decide on. Okay, the next question is, is disease-related research discouraged at NSF? What if the work advances the basic understanding of biology? So disease-related is not discouraged, it just depends on the angle you're taking. Clinical or medical would be uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, but it just depends on the area. What angle are you taking with that disease-related research? So uh, as you said, if it's the basic understanding, then that could be under NSF's purview. Yeah. If- For instance, with the, with the coronavirus, NSF funded a significant amount of research because they were trying to understand the virus itself, the biology of the virus itself, um, which while that might have health implications, it was not specific, um, say for instance, to how patients were reacting to the coronavirus. So that might be a little bit nuanced, but hopefully that helps illustrate the point. Okay, Um, Samantha, you talked about the goalie program. Um, What type of support must must industry provide? Industry is required to be uh, a a collaborator on a goalie proposal. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, yes, so NSF will fund the institution side of it. NSF does not fund the goalie side. So the overall, Cost there, you know, goalie would have the goalie aspect of it, uh, and NS- NSF would not be involved with covering any aspect of the in- industry side of it. So uh, that would be a discussion you could have with the program officer uh, to get further details on uh, what is some of the usual uh, uh, activities that are covered by industry. But it would be any of the expenses on the industry side. NSF would not cover that. So that is something the industry side will be covered by under a goalie project. But your program officer will be able to go through the details of that. We, we had a question um, from somebody who said, how do I know who my program officer is? Um, we always say, go contact your program officer. But yes. what do you think is the best way to, to determine that? Well, if you are looking at a solicitation, a program solicitation, you have contact information in that solicitation that tells you who the program officers are. It may be an individual, it may be a group of people. So the program officers are identified in the program solicitation uh, in uh, any uh, descriptions, anything NSF puts out, you will have a cognizant NSF program officer attached to that. Uh, If it's unsolicited, again, you then would have to determine what area you're uh, submitting the proposal to, or you, you're thinking of submitting the proposal to at NSF. And on the NSF website, you will see uh, staff identified uh, in the different areas. Uh, and you would contact an individual there. That person may then become your program officer or direct you to the appropriate person. Right. And if you don't hear from someone uh, right away, um, don't worry. Uh, you may want to follow up with a second email. You may want to make a phone call. If after a while, though, you're not getting a response, you want to look at that. You can look all of our contact information is on the website and you can go to the organization's website and kind of see you know, who the deputy division director is. And that might be somebody you might want to go to if you're not getting any response from 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 a program officer. But not right away. <laughs> but not right away. Obviously not right away. Yeah. And um, some solicitations also have uh, aliases. So it may be one or two people, or you may have a group of people, you know, maybe four or more uh, program officers or cross directorates. So there is an alias. So there are multiple people you can reach as well on the program officer level. Somebody's asking about the use of rotators and IPAs at NSF and, and rotators and IPAs. These are, are people that come from the research community to NSF. Um, they, uh, they become government employees when they come to NSF and they, they run the programs. Um, somebody is asking, are they trained as, 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 regular full-time NSF staff and how are they trained? And so we do have a, a robust way of, of training NSF, new NSF staff, whether they're full-time permanent federal employees or they're rotators or, 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 or IPAs. Um, and, and they are trained in the same way that a, that a federal program officer would be. 
Um, uh, we have a question, does NSF make uh, awards to independent researchers? Samantha. Okay. No. Yes. No. Uh, NSF does not make awards to independent researchers. Uh, you, there has to be an affiliation with a U.S. Uh, organ with an organization. Okay. Um, are there any proposal types that prioritize funding research involving undergraduate students or primarily undergraduate institutions? There's the REU program, REU the research experiences for undergraduates and the research at undergraduate institutions, the RUI program. Yes. So um, we have both of those that, that you should take a look at. Somebody asked, where do I find program solicitations? They are on the NSF website under uh, find funding. Uh, you also can go to, if you know the area of science you're uh, interested in, the discipline, you can go to that uh, website at NSF, that particular directorate. Uh, but there is a find funding uh, site on the NSF website and you will have a list of the uh, funding opportunities. Uh, Caitlin, here's a, a budget question for you asking about the near and long term prospects for the social behavioral and economic sciences funding uh, with respect to the 2020 budget. Um, so they're interested in, in social science funding at NSF. Yeah, so for fiscal year 2020, which just ended September 30th. Um, so SBE has um, I mean, I think in the past there have been some concerns about declining um, funding, but we have gotten a specific direction from Congress in each of the last appropriations, and I expect we will get it again, to at least hold that funding flat with the prior year. So um, I don't expect that, while that was a concern at one time, um, I don't believe that is still an issue um, of folks seeing specific reductions um, that are targeted to SB. Okay, Samantha, here's a question. Are there funding opportunities available for non-US organizations? Well, NSF rarely directly funds uh, non-US organizations. Uh, so if you're asking about direct funding, uh, the answer is mostly no. Like I said, it's rare, uh, but we do have collaborations. Uh, so um, as long as the solicitation does not state specifically no, you would have to uh, likely be a co-PI, you would have to collaborate with a U.S. institution, a U.S. organization. Right, and we had a similar question about what programs do you recommend for international institutions? The, the thing to remember here is that NSF will fund the U.S. portion mm -hmm. of, the, of the program, and there are many times um, uh, linkages with international organizations, but they tend to be a sub award uh, on, on a program. And we will have a session uh, later uh, during this, this conference on, on international programs, what we fund and how we collaborate with, with international organizations. I am interested in submitting a rapid proposal. Who do I contact? If I remember correctly, we need to discuss this with someone. That's for you, Samantha. Yes, that will be your program officer. Uh, and again, there is no single program officer uh, to, to send you to. So again, you would determine which uh, discipline and you would contact uh, a program officer in that area. Okay, so the program officers are listed when you determine which area of science you're interested in uh, and you go to, that, to the website for that particular directorate, you will then see the different areas that fall under that directorate and you determine which one best suits you. And there'll be program officers listed under that particular area. Okay, we had a question, Samantha, uh, asking if NSF plans to reinstate IPAs for the policy office. Um, I don't know, somebody we know might be asking this question. I was gonna we... say, is this a <laughs> trick question here? Uh, Pretty sure I'm not the one to answer that, but I will say, sure, of course we plan to reinstate that. Yeah, I have no idea, <laughs> but I'll say yes. There is no hard no for that, so we'll see. Right. We're always open. Yeah. And we and we have had, um, just so everyone out here is aware, we've had uh, IPAs, and IPA stands for Intergovernmental Intergovernmental Personnel Act. It's one of our wonderful acronyms that we use in the federal government, uh, but that is the 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 
description of somebody who's coming to NSF uh, for a defined period of time to work as a government employee um, uh, alongside our, our federal colleagues um, and help run programs, but we also have them come and they've, they've worked on the administrative side of the house as well. We've had them in the policy office as well. Um, so I think we've answered quite a lot of questions and a lot of the questions that are coming in are duplicative as, as, I'm, as I'm scrolling through them. Um, and I think we've answered many of them. So I wanna thank both uh, Caitlin and uh, Samantha for participating today uh, as, uh, and answering all of your questions. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us today and hopefully you'll stick around and attend some of the other sessions where if you didn't get your question answered today, um, it will most definitely be answered through some of the more targeted and topical uh, sessions that we hold over the next uh, week and or two weeks. So thank you again for joining and um, remember to ask early and ask often and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>